Well, Mr. Bond, here we are again. And yes, I know that I probably should be rushing out to see No Time to Die. I'm probably not going to get to it until next week because, you know, life makes things difficult. Uh, a lot of the time. I was going to say some of the time. A lot of the time. But uh, I need to finish out the commissioned selective viewing of James Bond that I uh, that I was set up to do through my Patreon. Check it out there if you uh, want to support me at all or if you want to look into commissioning me to review something. And so the selection for Daniel Craig, because I was supposed to have this done uh, before we got to the release of No Time to Die, um, the selection was Skyfall, which is the Daniel Craig Bond movie I like the most. I also hadn't seen it in a while, in a few years. And uh, unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, I knew this going in. Knowing that I already liked it, I did that thing that I've talked about before, which is when going in for the purposes of a review, not just to enjoy it, but for the purposes of a review and to try and think about it critically, I'm going to look for the faults in something that I know that I like, and I'm going to try and look for the good points in something that I know that I don't. So uh, I, I am going to be pointing out some issues with this, but let me say up front, I like this a lot. I think it is very good. It's certainly the most front to back, good, solid, well paced as a complete package Daniel Craig movie. Haven't seen No Time to Die yet, but like short of that one that he did. I know other people point to Casino Royale, and Casino Royale's good, but it's also three movies crashed into one, and it's with very clear demarcation points, and its overall pacing as a complete package is a little off, but um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. So, Skyfall in a lot of ways is kind of the almost... I would say, nearly perfect marriage between the more stripped-down, serious-minded sensibilities that were brought into place and the sort of core Bond elements that people at this point were probably missing a little bit. And we're going, okay, yeah, I know that, you know, we said when Casino Royale came out that the gritty grounded thing was what we needed, but then Quantum of Solace sucked and enough time has passed now in general because at the time it came out, you know, blockbuster movies are starting to get fun and light again and maybe we're missing some of the fun stuff. And so integrating just enough of those elements to really pull together uh, as a very complete piece. And Craig is doing good work here, as is uh, M, obviously. Uh, I mean, <laughs> crying out loud. Judy Dench, you know, she signed off this role in glorious fashion. But everybody's good. Ben Wishaw's good as Q. Naomi Harris is good as Money Penny. She's actually, she's really good <laughs> as Money Penny. I like her a lot in this. And of course, we have Javier Bardem as Silva, who is a pretty decent villain. There are a few issues sort of circling around Silva. None of them have to do with the performance, though. Performance, really good. There's something about this that I'm not actually sure is an issue or not, or if it's just me. Um, which I suppose is true of any criticism I care to level, but, like, especially in this case. Part of me was tempted when I sat down to shoot this to say, you know, it's a little slow on the rewatch. Because it is kind of deliberately paced and it does take its time um, with any given scene. It's not, you could never accuse it of being rushed. I'm not sure that it's actually slow, though. I think the issue is, is that for me, with ADHD, it suited a uh, movie theater viewing experience much more. Because when I go into a movie theater, there's nothing for me to do other than watch the movie. That there's nothing else for me to look at, fiddle with, be distracted by. I'm sitting in a chair pointed directly at a massive screen in the dark. So I, in that environment, I'm able to appreciate the way it's shot. And it's shot gorgeously. And appreciate the pacing and the way it's intended. Whereas home viewing with, you know, all the stuff in my house around and my phone's right there. And it's like, yeah, it's it's harder. It's it. it feels more drawn out. But again, I'm not sure that's actually an issue with the movie. I think that's actually just me. Um, but 
honestly, most of the things that I kind of hit on and be like, eh, are for the most part, if I'm being honest, kind of nitpicky. Because like, there's one thing that I noticed that I hadn't noticed before that is kind of stupid, but like, it's also like, whatever, which is that, uh, and like, I know what one people are saying. Yeah, no, no, no. We'll, we'll catch that train when we get to it. Um, but when Bond first shows up again after being presumed dead and he's getting his evaluation, he pulls some shrapnel out of his shoulder from the wound he received during the cold open chase sequence. This is months later. So he's just been walking around for months with shrapnel stuck in his shoulder. And like, okay, maybe I could buy he went to a crap surgeon, but like it was easily accessible enough for him just to stick a knife in there and dig it out with his hands. Like if you knew it was there and your surgeon didn't get it, why, why did you leave it? Why has that been sitting there for three months? You idiot. Like that's... <laughs> That should be infected as hell, for one thing. And, like, some of the things that don't track are also kind of staples of Bond. So, like, the fact that those bullet fragments um, are like, ooh, this, this kind of bullet only six people use. Here, look at these mugshots. Like, that's really dumb. In, in, in real life, the idea of hired killers having a signature weapon that could easily be traced back to them is very stupid, but it's also very Bond. So, let that go. But then there's, okay, so there's all the stuff with Silva's plot. Now, Silva as a character, particularly in his motivation, really good. I love that this is personal. I love that as much additional damage as Silva is causing to other agents, to just people in the area, because he's blowing stuff up, that all he cares about is M. I like that it's personal because it's it's a nice way to have something with someone as skilled as him to have a threat feel big without having to be like and i shall take over the world which is a bit more the traditional bond thing hadn't been in the craig era granted but um it's nice to find that balance here and i think it's it's quite well done in terms of motivating what it is he's doing. I'm not entirely sure what why he has a personal army. Yes, I'll take it that he pays them, but what he's currently trying to do isn't going to make him any money. And I have to imagine at least some of them would bail when they start to realize how dangerous this is and there isn't going to be a massive payday uh, associated with this particular job. Like, I, I don't know. That's, again, that's me overthinking. Because, like, trying to think about why, how, how any... Um, Big Bad employs henchmen and doesn't lose them it is, is is another rabbit hole that you... I'm not sure any film uh, in the Bond franchise holds up to that kind of scrutiny. Uh, that said, though, they did kind of the interesting thing where Silva is both the mastermind and the uh, main physical threat. Because usually you are dealing with a mastermind villain and a primary henchman who is usually the physical threat. Even if the mastermind villain can't hold their own in a fight, you're still going to have that key henchman. Because, like, take Goldeneye with Alec Trevelyan. He's a match for Bond, but he's still got his henchman like Xenia on the top. So that's still very much a staple, and Silva doesn't really have that. He has a ton of faceless henchmen. Like, again, possibly too many. But they combined the standard, like, really memorable, um, dangerous physical threat and the actual mastermind behind the plan into one character, whereas usually Bond tends to have that be two people. So that was kind of cool, and I, I think that worked well. But, uh, let's, <laughs> let's get to the, uh, the elephant in the room, or the train in the tunnel, that most people are quick to point out, which is, okay, so, Silva's plan overall doesn't make a lot of sense. Or for it to make sense, a lot of insanity has to happen. And the main culminating thing that people tend to point to is when he is escaping Bond, he uh, fires off this explosive behind him, and they're in these, these tunnels uh, below the underground uh, train stations, 
and the explosion is behind Bond. It doesn't kill him. Um, and Bond's like, I hope that wasn't for me. And Silva's like, no, but that is. And then a train comes barreling through the hole that got blown up. Um, so the idea that this chase would occur in such a way that he knew he'd be followed and the timing would be such that he could blow up that spot and have a train get thrown at whoever was chasing him, whether he thought it'd be Bond or somebody else, it is ridiculous. The thing is, though, it's not actually that much more ridiculous than the entire rest of his plan. Because what kicks off him being captured so that he can end up in, uh, in MI6? And to have his computer hooked up to their stuff to then infect it with a virus that sets so much stuff off. Well, it required that MI6... Well, first of all, <laughs> let's back up. How did how did they find him? Well, they found him through the shrapnel, stuck in Bond's shoulder. So Bond had to A, survive that previous encounter, not do anything about the shrapnel for three months, come back, get it analyzed be able to positively identify the guy who was involved in that cold open that shot him, then track that guy down on this specific job in this specific location, kill him. You have to assume that the plan required Bond to kill him in order to find a poker chip in the guy's um, sniper rifle suitcase, go to Shanghai to the casino where that can be cashed in to then get in touch with this woman who will ask him to help her get away from Silva so that Bond can get there and then actually successfully capture Silva so that they're counting on Bond having the radio and having used it to signal for help to come and capture Silva so Silva can be taken to MI6. That's ridiculous. Every step of that is ridiculous and could fall apart at literally every piece of it. Now, this isn't super shocking because I don't know if people note it as much now, but definitely at the time, more than a few people noted that Silva, at least his plan, not his characterization, but his plan, certainly, was pretty reminiscent of uh, Heath Ledger's Joker in The Dark Knight, where he would have to have either 5,000 contingency plans that never got triggered, and this just happened to be the one <laughs> that did happen, or he has to be freaking clairvoyant because so many things fell into place in a precise way that should not have been something that he could have predicted. And even if he did, is a waste of resources and people because like I said, this plan required that some of the people in his employ get killed along the way. What? So as much as the train moment sort of caps off and is the height of the wait a minute, thing, his entire plan is ridiculous. So if you're going to pull that thread, the entire movie's going to come apart. And I will say, that's true here, that's true of The Dark Knight. And that's something you need to be prepared to swallow as part of suspension of disbelief. And had the entire film been more seriously minded in terms of gritty and grounded, I might have said it was a fairer criticism. But the thing is, like I said, it brings in just enough of the elements of the slightly more ridiculous eras of Bond that I'm like, I think this is part of straddling that line. Because when you have acknowledgements like, well, first of all, just bringing Q in at all. We hadn't had a Q up to this point. They bring in the classic Aston Martin. It's even got the ejector button. So like there's, there's all these nods and these acknowledgements like we're bringing in some of the old stuff. And for me, a really convoluted plan that shouldn't work and doesn't make sense, that comes as part of that package. So I actually don't think that is as big a problem as some people make it out to be. I mean, like, look, if that train moment happens and it takes you out of the movie and you go, what? No. I can't say that you're wrong. I'm just saying that that's just the cap or on a whole pile of nonsense that you will either decide, I'm just going to overlook that, or it will ruin the movie for you. I, I, and that can be taken as a fault to put something that is going to put audiences in an either-or situation where you either buy it or you go, uh, no, I can't anymore. So, if you want to label that as a fault, that's fine. But as someone who did go with it, I'm okay. I'm good. I'll tell you what I didn't need, though. I didn't need, um, I believe her name is Severine? So the woman that Bond 
meets at the casino, who is given a backstory of having been a sex worker, probably trafficked as a child. First of all, just the fact that he sleeps with her at all already feels gross. Given that backstory, given that we're setting her up as someone who has had a lifetime of non-consensual um, encounters with men, that he would even try and put the moves on her in that shower already kind of feels gross on its own. And like, I'm not, I'm not trying to take away her ability to have agency in her own sex life. It's not like because you have sex related trauma, you can't get with anyone ever because, oh, that's gross. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying the way in which she's presented, all we have is this background of horrible sexual trauma. And then she sleeps with the guy who gets her killed. And just the way she's handled in general is I think the one um, issue of an element of more classic Bond movies being introduced that doesn't fit. Because a, a lot of the stuff that's here, that's I, and I kind of brought this up in License to Kill, where it felt like it wanted to be something other than a Bond movie, but it kept shoving Bond movie stuff in it, and it wasn't gelling. For the most part, the more grounded, not traditional Bond elements of this do work with the traditional Bond elements introduced, except where that character is concerned. Because she's brought in because it is fairly standard tradition for Bond to bed someone associated with the bad guys and for that person to die. But she is painted so thinly, she is painted as being connected to him, possibly against her will, having a background of sexual slavery, and then, you know, even when, before she gets shot, we see she's been smacked around and beaten around. She is, she is brutalized to a degree that is not necessary and adds nothing. And just, look, if you narratively think you need her there to help get Bond on that island, and then you kill her off because she lacks narrative utility, fine, but you didn't need to have him bang her, and you definitely didn't need to display her as knocked around and brutalized before she gets shot in the head in a long extended sequence where she's clearly panicked for her life for about three continuous minutes. It's cruel. And sometimes Bond can get away with that with characters, even female characters, who have been shown to be in some way villainous. Like, I I kind of praised the brutality of the kill of Electra King in The World Is Not Enough, but she is a character who we had a lot of context for. We have very little context for Severine, and the context we have makes this gross. And it's a, it's, it's a Bond trope that is forced into the thing and doesn't work in my personal opinion. So the other thing I wanna say, I, I wanna bring up the climax, because one of the things that actually is quite cool about this is it's kind of an inversion of your standard Bond climax, because your standard Bond climax has Bond um, leading an assault on the villain's base of operations, whether that be, you know, just where they're currently set up, whether it be a train or at a satellite thing, or whether it be a volcano base, whatever. So here instead, we have Bond setting up traps for the villain to come into. And that's a fun inversion. And it's done without too many sly wings and being like, eh, eh, we're flipping it around. And no, it just does it, which is the best way to do those kinds of subversions. So uh, the tail end is quite good. Uh, I'm not I mean, the, the, the mommy issues with Silva, eh, I could take him or leave him. But again, Javier Bardem uh, plays the character really well. And the movie as a whole is just good. Even if it wasn't a Bond movie, I do think this is just a good movie. Because sometimes you have to grade Bond on a scale. Yeah, you have, you have to grade on a curve of other Bond movies. But even just as an espionage action movie, Bond elements removed. Still a good movie. So, Skyfall, have you rewatched it lately? Or have you seen No Time to Die yet?
No spoilers, but if you want to tell me what you thought about that, whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. I already plugged the Patreon, so like, share, subscribe. Those help me out. No big pressure, though. We take a relaxed attitude around here, so just come on back next time you need a break.